Hey, welcome back to The Health Bridge. Dr. Pedram here talking about depression today. Um, I, when we looked up the, the statistics on this, it was kind of staggering. I, I knew it was bad, but I didn't know how bad. 14.8 uh, million American adults uh, suffer from it, and uh, women twice women are twice as much as men. So this is a big deal for women. Uh, 70 billion in medical costs, and uh, it, it's just it's out of control. It's spinning out of control. And um, I am fortunate to have awesome friends, and I have one with us today who uh, just wrote a best-selling book on the subject, and she is. She doesn't come from the, the, the traditional school, although she's studied there. She is one of the most innovative kind of like go get them docs I've ever met. And she's delightful. I want to welcome her to the show right now, Dr. Kelly Brogan. Hi. Total pleasure to be here with you. Really exciting. Great, great, great. You and I have uh, hung out uh, socially a couple times, had a few interactions, but you're on that other coast, which means I don't get to see you that often. <laughs> um, so your book, um, a mind of your own, um, the truth about depression and how women can heal their bodies and reclaim their lives. Beautiful, really well done, and uh, kind of came out of nowhere. Like you, you, there was almost like a media ban on you, and it was just this weird thing where you weren't getting any coverage, and you should have been, and then it was just this kind of grassroots groundswell that brought your book out, and they couldn't ignore it. And um, here, here. I mean, this is this is great. I'm, I'm I'm loving the fact that you're a bestseller. I'm loving the fact that you've made your splash and you're just getting started. It's difficult, you know. It's difficult material to confront if uh, you've you've sort of cozied into the assumption that you know we've cracked the code on mental health and we know how to help people who are suffering. You know, not just from depression, but from anxiety or OCD, schizophrenia, bipolar, you name it, all of these labels that we love to toss around in psychiatry. So this material is shocking, and it certainly was to me, believe me. I mean, it's, I dedicated my entire career to this paradigm, and so for me to really let it all go was, was as difficult as it, as it should be, really, for the mainstream to accept. And so I understand that it has unfolded this way, and I'm just excited that there's such receptivity on the ground level, you know, for, for the message in this book. Yeah, well, so you're a psychiatrist. Uh, you've got a booming practice in New York. Uh, you're also a co-editor of a textbook called Integrative Therapies for Depression, uh, and you've come from there, right? Like, you've looked at all the drugs. You've prescribed the drugs, I'm assuming, and so what, what happened? Like, what, what happened in this kind of revolution in your thinking where you realized that maybe uh, we're going the wrong way? Yeah, so I come from a very conventional background. I mean, I was not raised a hippie. My parents are sort of like, you know, blue collar. My mom is an immigrant. She and my dad very much instilled in me this notion that, um, you know, authority is to be respected. You know, education is everything and, you know, pushed me to the point of medical school. I was always interested in the brain, I guess, and behavior. Um, I worked a suicide hotline at MIT where I went to college, and I was also studying neuroscience, so I really created this illusion that we had all of the tools we needed you know, to help people with human suffering, right? We have the science, we have the profession, which is psychiatry. You know, I was supervised by a psychiatrist in this, working this hotline, and so I went to um, you know, medical school and, and pursued residency in psychiatry with that intention. And I've always been a self-identified feminist in many different incarnations, you know. Um, in that, in those days, I was very much, you know, sort of interested in how could I obscure all the elements of, of my womanhood so that I could, like, play in the field with the boys. You know, that was the kind of feminism I espoused. I took birth control endlessly for 12 years. You know, I was really excited about the HPV vaccine when it came out. I thought if I ever have a kid, it's definitely going to be by elective cesarean. Like who would ever bother with experiencing pain of childbirth if you don't need to? You know, this was very much the mentality that I came from. And I really wanted to be good at prescribing drugs. And I focused a lot of my intellectual energy on developing that skill. And I specialized in what was called what is called reproductive psychiatry, right? So essentially I specialized in medicating pregnant and breastfeeding women. So dealing with mental illness and pregnancy and postpartum. And it wasn't until I was pregnant myself in my fellowship. And I remember writing a prescription for a pregnant woman for Zoloft. And I remember thinking, God, you know, I have all this data at my fingertips. 
25,000 cases in the literature is, you know, for the most part, reassuring science. And I would never want to take this medication as a pregnant woman. Like, what is that about? You know, that I have this conflict. I sort of ignored it. And it wasn't until I was nine months postpartum myself, uh, my first pregnancy, that I was diagnosed with Hashimoto's thyroiditis. So it's my first medical issue ever. I'd been trashing my body for decades up until that point, literally eating like Snickers and Twizzlers every day, eating at McDonald's and White Castle and drinking Red Bull and not sleeping, never exercise because I never had a weight problem, right? So why would I exercise? And so it was really um, a come to Jesus for me to, 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 to think about the prospect of taking a prescription for the rest of my life. That's all I cared about. I was like, I, there's got to be an escape hatch. Like, how do I get out of this? I don't want to deal with this. So it was from that mentality that I... I consulted with a naturopath, which was so out of character for me to do something like that. I mean, our entire training is really built upon, you know, putting natural medicine and alternative medicine, quote unquote, into a nice harmless box in the corner, right? And and really dismissing it as benign at best and, you know, dangerous at worst. So I consulted a naturopath, changed my diet, put a potentially chronic and even debilitating autoimmune disorder into remission within a couple of months. You know, I had antibodies in the high 2000s that came into the normal range. My entire gastrointestinal system and brain function was revolutionized basically by taking gluten and dairy out of my diet. And a lot of red flags were raised because I basically said to myself, you know, I I never learned about any of this in my very expensive training. You know, I never learned that diet mattered. I never learned you could put a chronic autoimmune disease into remission. You could only manage it largely with medication, right? Um, so that's when I began turning stones over, and I left none untouched. You know, I, I started to look at common medications that I'd always thought were, you know, God's gift to humanity, things like statins, uh, birth control, antibiotics, painkillers. Um, I began looking at, you know, the the real science, the science that I had not been exposed to in my training or from my mentors, um, around psychiatry. What is psychiatry? Is it a science? You know, what are we working with in terms of these medications? What are they really based on? And what I had to unlearn was epic. I mean, I basically had to let almost everything that I had, um, come to, you know, hold dear, uh, in terms of my understanding of the human body, um, and our ability to manage diseases, both acute and chronic, I had to turn it all on its head. And, it wasn't until I really embraced this departure that I began to really see changes in my outcomes in clinical practice. And I began to actually like cure people, you know, for all intents and purposes rather than just manage them. Uh, and the mindset that has come with that has been so, so empowering and liberating that I want to share it. All right. So I, I think it'd be nice to kind of take a, a step back real quick and just say, okay, what, what, what is depression? Like what's the definition of clinical depression so that we can start looking at uh, some of the, the kind of psychiatric views and then the stuff that you kind of stumbled into. I wouldn't say stumbled into because you worked your ass off to go learn all this <laughs> stuff, right? Um, and, and, you know, it's kind of created a whole new frame of mind and a frame of reference for you on it. Yes, yes. So we're told a story about depression, right? We're told that it's probably something that you're born with and it manifests under stress at a certain point in your life and it reveals that you have this chemical imbalance, right? It's a, it's a brain-based problem. You're going to have to manage it with other chemicals to compensate for your imbalance probably for the rest of your life, right? So you've just been dealt this bad hand and thank goodness we've, we've learned as much as we have about human biology that we have something to offer you, you know, that's, that's largely safe and effective. And so, so that is not only the message that we are indoctrinated with in our, in our conventional training, but it's also, um, really a myth that permeates on a social level so deeply that I find even many of my, you know, open-minded, uh, practitioner colleagues, have come to believe this about depression, right? So, and most of it is because we are victims of direct-to-consumer advertising. We're one of two countries in the world, New Zealand being the other, that allows um, corporations, you know, pharmaceutical companies to speak directly to consumers about their health. 
And so they have been telling us for many decades now that depression is a chemical imbalance. You know, they have little pictures of neurons with bubbles, you know, floating between them um, to Looks depict. Very smart. It's, <laughs> right. It looks really official, right? Uh, to depict what, what they believe is going on on a biochemical level. And of course, psychiatry as a discipline has sought to legitimize itself medically for, for many, many decades. And so with the opportunity to engage in pharmaceutical medicine that really emerged in the 1950s um, with observations around uh, anti-tuberculosis medications and their potential effect on mood, um, you know, that there, there was the development of MAO uh, inhibitors and, of course, the the use, incidental use of antipsychotics, and there really was this groundswell of, um, you know, just this energy like, yes, we finally have our tools, we're finally legitimate, uh, you know, science-based doctors. And so the humble origins of the chemical imbalance theory of depression are, are pretty concerning, actually. You know, there's not a lot there. Um, it was really an opportunistic uh, moment in, in the history of medicine where psychiatry just sort of uh, jumped on this, this wagon. And since that, in six decades, believe it or not, there is no legitimate science to suggest that depression has anything to do with a replicable chemical imbalance. And this was pretty shocking to me because we are taught that it has most likely something to do with serotonin imbalance or maybe serotonin deficiency, right? And you'll even, you know, learn of the alternative options, right, to Zoloft or Prozac is, um, you know, St. John's Ward or tryptophan or 5-HTP for its uh, serotonin boosting uh, capacity. You might even see like, you know, drinks and bars at the health food store that claim to boost your serotonin for your mood. And the truth is that we really don't have any scientific evidence that serotonin has much to do with mood, let alone uh, deficiency being a direct causal link to depression. So I, I know that that's confusing, right? Because so how did we get that idea? Um, but the truth is, in many ways, we have worked backwards from observed effects of medication and tried to come up with underlying disease mechanisms, right? But that's sort of like saying if you're an anxious person and you have two shots of vodka and you feel better, it's sort of like saying you probably have an alcohol imbalance and you probably should just do this every single day to prevent this from occurring in the future, right? We sort of intuitively know that wouldn't be great advice and we know there would be consequences to that uh, if you were to con actually adhere to that advice. Um, but in many ways, that's exactly what's going on with psychiatric medications is that not only are we not fixing an underlying imbalance, but we're actually creating an imbalance. We're creating a gradient against which the body has to adapt. Uh, and then it's in that adaptation that we see, um, you know, sort of how we set people up to not only experience more and more repetitive relapses in their mood and stability, um, the development of diagnoses like bipolar disorder when all you were dealing with was, you know, initially was some flat mood and tearfulness, let's say. Uh, but then we also have this epidemic of people who are stuck on these meds and having a lot, a lot of trouble coming off them because from my um, ex clinical experience, at this point now, a decade into taking people off of these medications, I honestly have to say that I don't think there's a more habit-forming chemical on the planet. I mean, I don't see anyone taking people off of heroin or Oxycontin or alcohol, you know, at, at 1% to 5% of the total daily dose per month. Never heard of such a thing, you know, and I have to do this regularly in my practice just to keep people literally medically stable. So... This is big stuff we're dealing with. You know, there's a, a, an untold story of these medications, and they really only come into play if we believe that depression is a chemical imbalance that they're going to fix. Um, but something important to know about psychiatry is that we don't have any tests, right? We don't have any objective measures for determining what your diagnosis is. You go to your family practice doctor, you go to a psychiatrist, you have a conversation, sometimes for as little as 10 to 12 minutes. And you're given a label, and that label goes with a pill. But the truth is that depression isn't something we can assess for through a brain scan, through you know an EEG, through blood work. Um, so we really are left back at your question, right? Which is, well, what is it then? Right. 
And, and, and my argument is that I like to reframe it as a symptom. It's just a sign of many, many, many different potential sources of imbalance. And, and I focus a lot on physiology, maybe because, you know, I come from a medical, you know, background. Um, and I'm interested in the fact that, you know, conditions like what I was diagnosed with, you know, thyroid dysfunction, that blood sugar imbalance, that specific food reactions, um, that medication side effects can all buy you a diagnosis of depression and are completely reversible if you identify what is your driver. But then, of course, there are other um, mismatches, right? There's psychospiritual mismatch. There's, you know, are you living a purpose-driven life? Are you attending to the many um, meta signals that your body expects in terms of movement, in terms of sleep, in terms of sunlight exposure, you know, often depression is just the, the expression on the part of your mind, body, and spirit that there is a vast mismatch here. And in the literature, it's called evolutionary mismatch because we've come all these millions of years to expect certain stuff, right? Mm. And we're not giving ourselves that stuff. And so sometimes it's just a reminder of that and really an opportunity to, to check out what's behind it. I mean, the first half of your book is called The Truth About Depression, and it's basically getting into all this. So sunlight, movement, exercise, family love, you know, social connections, all of these things, all these things that are part of uh, this vast ecosystem that used to make us whole. And you know, you look at modern life, and it's just fragmented. And so it's yes. obviously it's obviously a serotonin deficiency, and you you got to take these pills. I mean, that right, right, right. It's 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 incredibly limiting, and it's one of these things where um, you know, look, and people look, people suffer from lots of you know very terrible things with depression. People kill themselves. I mean, it's 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 obviously uh, a, a very challenging uh, issue in our society. So then the question becomes. Looking at this the way you are kind of coming at it and reframing it, what then becomes the type of solution set if it's not pharmacological? Mm. Well, you might be interested in, in the fact that actually, uh, according to research, much of which I've recently synthesized because there was a, an announcement in the New York Times that um, there's been a vast increase in suicides uh, across the nation. And, you know, you would think that's a call to action for more treatment, right? But if you look behind the veil of the pharmaceutical research, you'll find that in many, many um, studies, there is a fourfold increase in risk of suicide if you are medicated. On the drugs, yeah. Right, right. So that's, that's tough news because we want to think that, well, you've got to do something for these people who are struggling. But what if, you know, they're falling off a cliff and what we're handing them is like a knife instead of, like a hand, right? Mm -hmm. So, so there is a hand to, to offer, you know, people who are struggling. And in my opinion, it's as close as we can probably come to a relatively quick, safe and easy fix. It's what we were looking for. It's just that we thought that it was supposed to come in a pill. And, you know, if I could disabuse anyone of any assumption, it's that these pills are safe and really that they're effective. I mean, they don't work in the ways that we think they do. Um, and, and there's a lot of literature to suggest that when they do have an effect, that it's short term and that it's potentially driven by the belief that they will have an effect, mm -hmm. right? It doesn't mean you're being duped or fooled or anything. It's called the active placebo effect. It's a very real phenomenon. It's a beautiful phenomenon, right? Actually, if you understand there's even, you know, neuroendocrinology to explain why what we believe about our health engagements has an effect, you know, when it does. Um, but it's not worth it at the cost that these meds come at, right? There's been, there's been a lot of different kind of data points that people have kind of chucked at me over the years about how a lot of these drugs barely outperform placebo. Yes. How yeah, it's hard, it's hard to wrap your mind around. I mean, every time I lecture about this, there will be someone in the audience who is all indignant and, you know, gets up and says, well, I don't care what you say, you know, Prozac saved my life or like my husband's only alive because of Zoloft or it's like sort of like this feeling of having been convicted by, you know, what I am sharing. And it's absolutely not the case. I mean, the fact that there are some people who perceive these medications to be helpful is not in question. It's why and how are they helpful, right? So, and that's the surprising data because, um, there was this guy, there's this guy, Irving Kirsch, who's a psychologist who did some pretty tremendous uh, research that really should have 
decimated the paradigm of psychiatry if it was allowed to, right? And because this was back in 2008 that he put out this definitive meta-analysis that when he called upon literature that was not um, published, right? So that was hidden basically by pharmaceutical companies. They're allowed to do that, actually. You know, they can have a file drawer that's locked with all the inconvenient truths inside it, right? Mm. So when he included that, he found that the active placebo effect, uh, which is when you are using a sugar pill to contrast your treatment, right? People are not going to have side effects like dry mouth or headache or some gastrointestinal distress with a sugar pill. So when they have those side effects versus not, they start to tell themselves, oh gosh, I'm in the treatment group. Yes. Like all of that healing is happening. All of those chemical imbalances are being resolved just like I saw on channel four after the news the other day, you know, so they, all that messaging begins, right? Mm. And it's only because they had the side effects because it's being compared not to a medication with the same side effects, but to a sugar pill. That's called the active placebo effect. Because what happens if, is if you compare Zoloft, for example, to an active placebo like atropine to a medication that has the same side effects, there is no difference at all hmm. in their outcomes. Okay. So when you control for this, which he did through some very complex analysis, inclusive of all of the literature itself, which when you look at all of it shows that placebo outperforms these medications more often than not period, just like the percentage of studies that actually are positive when you include the unpublished ones is pretty concerning. Um, and he showed that the, the active placebo effect accounts for the vast majority of what we are calling, leaving about like 10 to 15 percent of what we are calling medication effect um, to only be attributed to the medication itself. That's so that's, it's hard to appreciate that. But I also think it's worth saying that these medications do have effects. It's not that they don't do anything. They have effects. And you may like the effects. Remember like the alcohol analogy? Mm -hmm. You might like the effects. They may be sedating in the right way for the right moment in your life. They may be activating or energizing in the right way. But they are not fixing anything. They're not curing anything. And that's a really important point because then you sort of get into how they are actually creating a different state for your body to, to, sort, of, to sort of struggle with. So, you know, we're really looking at a, a palette of treatment options in the conventional realm that overpromise and not only underdeliver, but really expose us to risks that are pretty concerning uh, when we're talking about impulsive, you know, uh, behavior, including homicide and suicide. When we're talking about um, a number of potential run-of-the-mill pharmaceutical side effects, like you know, increased bleeding risk and risks to liver and kidney function, etc. Risk small to stuff. Lethal. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it really almost becomes small stuff yeah. relative to to these you know lesser known side effects. Um, and the dependency issue. So then, you know, so then what can you do instead? Like, could something else really even work, let alone as well? Um, and that's when you have to sort of first accept that there is something in your symptoms that you need to pay attention to, right? So first is that mindset shift where the goal goes from becoming getting your symptoms gone as quickly as possible and suppressed as quickly as possible, the goal then shifts to understanding what your specific symptoms are actually reflecting about your bodily imbalances. Um, so that's why, you know, I've become really, really passionate about like food and nutrition forward interventions because there are a number of different imbalances that could be operative. You could be working with someone who could help you to figure that out relatively easily but you could also just do one thing that addresses many, many of these potential imbalances, right? Like the ones I mentioned, including food reactions. I mean, there's a, a very compelling literature implicating um, gluten and dairy, for example, in various different mental, il mental illnesses, right? Um, blood sugar instability. I have a patient who was having six panic attacks a day when she came to me on two psych meds on her way to electroconvulsive therapy, literally, who changed her diet basic changes. A month later, she came back and she said, I, this is the first month of my adult life. I have not had a panic attack. Hmm. This is not rocket science. All that we had done was balance her blood sugar. She was just on this epic roller coaster all day long of fight or flight induced by hypoglycemia, right? Of yeah. low blood sugar. You look at thyroid dysfunction and autoimmunity. Autoimmunity is a huge issue 
today with 100 diagnoses, you know, plaguing the population, it is so comorbid, meaning it, it almost always coexists with mental illness of some variety, whether it's chronic fatigue or inattention or anxiety or insomnia or depression. And so if you can address that immunoinflammatory signal through anything, it's going to, all of us would agree, it's, it's going to, you know, in the holistic world, it's going to first be cleaning up the source of epigenetic information that you're putting in your body every single day um, through your diet, right? Mm -hmm. So I've become pretty passionate about beginning there and then seeing what actually are you dealing with. And, you know, through my own personal experience, through my years of working with women, and then through my brief but very formative work with um, my now late mentor, Dr. Nicholas Gonzalez, who was a holistic cancer doctor here in New York, um, I've come, come to understand that there actually is a starting template that is effective for the majority of people. And then the responsibility rests on you to begin to listen to your inner compass, to your preferences, to re-engage with more intuitive eating, to see how to tailor it more personally to you. But I found that it's like, I don't know, a near miraculous intervention, you know, antidepressants, theoretically, any conventional psychiatrist will tell you, you need to give them six to eight weeks to work, right? Well, my patients from consultation to first follow-up give me a month. And what happens in that month is so reconfiguring. Of course, they're expected to take this prescription pretty seriously. I, you know, run a tight ship when it comes to, um, you know, readiness for change and expectation of, of real compliance around this, taking it pretty seriously. Uh, but what happens in a month continues to shock me because I still have that hat on that says that food doesn't matter. I only had an hour of nutrition education in my entire training. Yeah. So. Yeah. And, it, yeah. and it's just, it's so hard to think that all these kind of fancy interventions aren't like the answer. Uh, you said something I want to come back to because this is something I was looking at, oh, I guess like a decade or so ago. There were some old clinics in Russia that were doing um, gut cleansing for people that had severe psychiatric disorders and they were having complete, you know, resolution. And so, I, you know, I, I looked at this way before any of this stuff was cool. I was looking at this saying, well, what the <laughs> hell is going on, right? Right, it pokes a hole in the theory, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's like what, you know, so, so you're saying cleansing the colon is taking care of their psychiatric illness. What, what is that even implying? So uh, you mentioned this in your book. We're talking about the new biology of depression. When we're talking about gut microbiome, and what that does to our, um, our, our mental state and then just kind of chronic inflammation, uh, which usually starts in the gut. And so as we're talking about food, I'd love for you to wrap those, like tie those together. Yes, yes. Yeah, there was a case in the literature recently, actually. It was a woman who developed psychotic mania after a bariatric surgery, so like a stomach stapling, right? And never had it before, not like a mental patient per se, they gave her charcoal, right, so to absorb intestinal toxins, and they didn't do anything else, no psych meds or anything, and her symptoms resolved within 48 hours. So that one case alone should send us back to the drawing board about mental illness, mm. right, because there is nothing in that case that says she was born with a mental chemical brain imbalance that needs to be managed with Depakote and lithium for the rest of her life. There's nothing in that case that reflected back the gold standard, um, you know, treatment paradigm. So when we begin to encounter these, um, you know, sort of really challenging cases, we are forced to reconsider what it is that we're working with, right? And that just hasn't been happening on the grand scale, mm. uh, but it is happening quietly in the literature. It's it's been happening actually for almost twenty years that there has been a move away from what's called the monoamine hypothesis, so the chemical imbalance theory, and to move toward what is called the cytokine theory or the inflammatory model of depression, and the encompassing of that in a new discipline, which is called psychoneuroimmunology, right, which is what it sounds like. It's the mm -hmm. connection of all of these seemingly disparate systems that we, we thought had nothing to do with each other. You know, when I was in medical school, we didn't know, this was not that long ago, that the brain has an immune system, right? We only were taught that the brain has immune activity if you've had like a, a knife driven through your skull or something or an injury, right? Not on a da daily basis. We discovered, I think it was like last year in the past 18 months, that the brain has lymphatics. 
I mean, this is basic anatomy. We're so, I mean, so humbling, right? We just have so little idea what we're doing when it, when it comes down to it. But the most cutting edge science is telling us, um, is, and reflecting back to us what, what a lot of ancient uh, traditional you know, healing practices in medicine have known for a very long time, right? Which is that the gut is the seat of health. Um, and that there is interrelationship between all of these seemingly unrelated and distinct entities, right? So I think for many of us, it's intuitive that, you know, that our brain has an effect on the gut, right? We've all had like butterflies before the presentation, or we've lost our appetite when we fall in love, or, you know, these sorts of, um, this direction seems to make sense to us. But what, what is really requiring some mass education, particularly of the conventional medical world, is that the gut itself also signals directly to the brain, right? So that not only is there a nervous system, the enteric nervous system at the gut level, but that who's in charge of setting the tone for what's going on and really reading the environment um, is the microbiome. So is that ecology in our guts uh, that essentially dictates whether or not a, an inflammatory and associated immune response is necessary, right? So we think that the vagus nerve, which is a major conduit between the gut and the brain, is obviously, you know, much of how the signal is is transmitted. But we're actually learning about many different ways that inflammatory messengers travel from the gut to, to the brain. And even how our um, beliefs and fears can stimulate inflammatory messages from the periphery. So like from bone, you know, bone marrow, um, that then recruits the whole system uh, to cooperate together. Because that's the idea, right? This this mechanism is designed for a reason. It's designed to help arm us for response. Mm -hmm. It only becomes problematic when we have to arm ourselves all day, every day, for years on end, for decades on end, and there's unremitting um, stress and danger signal. And that's pretty much the situation that we're in, where this evolved mechanism for recalibrating our resources is now never turned off. Uh, and so in the psychiatric literature, there is a lot of data that suggests that um, lipopolysaccharide, for example, which is a component of, of gram-negative bacteria that doesn't belong like circulating around our blood system, um, when it gains entry to uh, systematic circulation, uh, you develop the symptoms of depression, right? So, you know, like you want to slow gut. down. Exactly. So leaky gut is a major component of it. And, you know, in the literature, of course, they call it intestinal permeability. But you can actually inject, apparently, a rat with LPS and induce a rat model of depression. That's actually what they do in the lab. So this gut-brain connection is so operative at the basic science level that they don't even, you know, it's just how it's done. But it, this knowledge hasn't permeated um, into clinical practice. And, and we know, right, that that's because it takes, like, something like 17 years mm -hmm. for what's being reflected in the literature to be adapted clinically. There's such a lag and such yeah. a adherence to what we call consensus medicine, which is just sort of like everyone's doing it, so everyone is going to keep doing it, yeah. which is, of course, where we're stuck now. Which is insane. Um, it's, you know, 17 years. I mean, think about the fallout of human suffering that comes from that. And, exactly. you know, just, I mean, aside from that, the billions of dollars a year being spent on interventions that don't do what they're supposed to be doing. And the exactly. whole thing, it's like, you think it, you think about where we're at in our medical science, it's almost like we're coming out of this adolescence phase where, you know, where it's like, I know everything, you know, like stand back, I got this. <laughs> <laughs> I like that, it's so true. Right, yeah, and then it's just like, holy crap, there's a glymphatic system in the brain and now there's like all this stuff in the gut. And so, uh, curious about that, you know, I know we have a lot of serotonergic receptors and activity in the gut. And the vagus mm -hmm. nerve, you know, the cranial nerve, everyone's kind of talking about how maybe that is where some of that connection with the inflammation and yeah. stuff happens. Um, is serotonin completely out or are we looking at maybe some other kind of circular mechanisms of serotonin um, in the gut that might be more, more rel relevant for depression than just the brain yeah. stuff? Great question. So, you know, there are something like a hundred different um, neurochemicals and peptides operative here, right? Uh, that's only what we've identified. So serotonin has gotten a lot of attention and it's, it's not all undue attention, um, but I believe it to be distracting because the truth is 
it plays a it plays a role, but it may be just as a signal of what is going on beneath, right? So there are researchers out of Canada, uh, Paul Andrews Group, and they've been really trying to take a crack at what, what does serotonin have to do with mental illness because they do not believe it has, it's a serotonin deficiency that drives depression, right? So he's actually made the argument that maybe it's actually serotonin excess that drives depression and that serotonin is a... Is a uh, a tool that the body uses to reallocate energy where it's needed. And so you see it as elevated when the body is under duress, right? So that's his argument. But really, there is no consistent indication that a serotonin imbalance, excess, or deficiency has a consistent relationship to depression. And that's mostly because depression isn't like a thing. It's not mm. one thing, mm. right? So, so if we're just going to look at the fact that it's a global imbalance, maybe it's inflammatory in nature a lot of the time, we still are not getting at where the money is for you as an individual, right? We still have to drill deeper. Uh, so to get distracted by what we really have been entrained around, which is that, you know, it's like levers and gears and, you know, it's like we want to think of like, oh, just a little more of this, just a little more of that. It's not the way it works. It's so much more complicated than that. And that's why, mercifully, you know, we have these top-down meta-signaling interventions like nutrition, like meditation, like movement, you know, like sleep, like sunlight exposure. We have these meta signals that do so much stuff that we don't even comprehend. Um, we're beginning to be able to quantify it. But, you know, I can change your microbiome in three days of a specific diet. Yep. You know, that's pretty powerful because otherwise you have to know what specific probiotic strain is going to work for you and is it multiple strains and it, you know or otherwise you might think you, know, you could use a medication to do that which of course is very wrong headed um, but it's just simpler it's like Occam's razor to use these mm -hmm. tools and part of it is actually honestly just taking it seriously enough so I think a lot of my success in clinical practice has been because I'm not messing around with this stuff like I take this really seriously mm -hmm. and I expect my patients to take it really seriously. And you don't even get another second appointment in my practice if you have not done the diet. So, <laughs> so, so it's part it's just that. Yeah, well, I mean, that's, and, and so you're actually taking stewardship, right, of your, your role as a physician to actually say, hey, look, you know, I know that this works and you're going to do it. Not, oh, you should try this wishy-washy stuff. But what we right. really know works is, you know, Merck's manual here. And so. Right, right, exactly. So, so the, the psychology and the framing of this is really important because, you know, through the 50s, we had this better living through chemistry type of uh, gestalt that came on. So, you know, eat, eat whatever you want. We got this, right? Like, you know, drugs, drugs, drugs. We figured this out. And so a lot of people, especially the baby boomers, are very much still stuck in that, that paradigm, right? They go in, the doctor right. tells them what to do, they do what, they do what they're told, and they feel better, whether it's placebo or, or some sort of right. intervention. And so this transition to lifestyle medicine, this transition to having kind of evidence-based recommendations that come from the, the, the simple stuff, right? Th yes. This is kind of wild, wild west, and I think a lot of people are yes. stuck on this. Yes, yes. It's... Um you know, it's so poetic what's happening and the shift that is, is occurring beneath our feet is really profound. And I didn't think it would happen this quickly. Uh, but even in the space of the last year, I feel like a collective, you know, sort of like turning away from what conventional medicine has to offer. I think that there is a deep sense that there's a bankruptcy in the model itself, mm. right? That it is... Um, it's met its match in terms of the way that we are sick, how we are sick, and more and more people are being um, exposed personally to its limitations, mm -hmm. its diagnostic limitations, its treatment limitations, and its potential to injure, right? So there is a readiness for a different mentality. It's just that we're in the bridge phase, right? And part of that bridge phase is using some of the old tools. Um, so, you know, I'm big into published literature. I read it every day. I collect it like, you know, some kind of collector's item. And I use it to express my opinions. In the end, I don't really care mm. 
about published literature. I know how corrupt the system is. I know that the journals are bought. I know that there are, you know, myriad reasons why a randomized placebo control trial has no ability to tell us the truth about human biology and experience. I get it all. But it's a tool that I can use to help bring people in to an awareness of um, really a model of self-care that it should feel like a remembrance, right? So if this is for you, then what I am saying, there should be like a little voice inside that says like, oh yeah, that makes sense, yeah. right? If it's for you. And then maybe you just need me to remind you of why it makes sense in the old language, right? Of, of science and randomized trials and everything else. But the truth is you already know all this stuff already and it needs to be repackaged in a legitimizing I mean, what I have to say as an MD, people have been saying for hundreds of years, this is not new. The only thing that's new is that it's coming from me, right? It's coming from a turncoat. <laughs> that's it. Turn I mean, coat. it's, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's really almost amusing for me to, to, mm. to witness that because I, I know it to be true, but mm. I also accept, you know, that, that role. And I also see that I, in many ways, am more passionate about the, the, sort of worshiping at the altar of natural medicine um, than some of my more naturally trained colleagues because I was on the other side, because I had anger fueling this process mm -hmm. for me, indignance and really even rage, you know. I probably made myself sick and put myself $200,000 in debt and wasted 10 years of my life learning a pile of lies. Like, believe me, that was what fueled my sleepless nights for many years, um, learning the truth about you know, yeah. pharmaceutical, the pharmaceutical model. So it, we've all we've all been duped in a way, right? I mean, this they 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 funded the education, they they right. basically supported the medical schools. All these smart people, present company included, went through this algorithmic training, right, and came out thinking, well, this is the answer. Who the hell might have questioned this? It's really right. interesting. I'm, there's this parallel right now. Our, our our next movie is called Prosperity, and it's about moving our money where our values are. And I've been looking at this kind of macroeconomic thing and looking at how, you know, growing our current economy in the, like kind of the, this kind of three-tiered economy is basically creating, it's like a tumor, it's like feeding a tumor. Like the more you grow these yes. businesses, the more they pollute, the more problems we have, and then government and, right. and dot orgs can't fix it. And so some of the things that we're looking at is like, okay, well, you know, let's go to the people that, that drafted the new way in Czechoslovakia and say, okay, well, you went from communism to capitalism. What did you right. do overnight to take, like basically get out of a completely different frame of thinking and just yeah. re-examine re how we do things. And I think we're in this kind of pushback place right now with medicine too. It's like you said, you know, this study came out in 2008 where it basically, if you read it right, it would render psychiatry irrelevant. But you get all these people that have, you know, the shit you got behind your head over there on the wall saying, hey, I went to all the, you know, I went to all this schooling and I, and, and I did this. I can't let go of this. So like, right. you know, what do people, do? yeah, what do people do, right? Like, it's, yeah, yeah. I, this is my job, this is everything that I know. I can't, I, I can't let go. Gotta feed the kids. Yeah, in the end, um, the system is gonna change at the grassroots level. I mean, the system is gonna change because enough people ha have that seed of doubt planted in them um, that the belief in this model is ruptured to an extent that there's such a demand for a new model that it's just going to atrophy, you know, that the, the, the current system is just going to atrophy. And so I just thought that that process would take like a really, really long time. Maybe I don't even know if it would happen in my lifetime. But what I find really exciting is that I feel it happening now. Mm. Like it's happening now. People are waking up at, at, at you know, at an epic accelerated speed. And, you know, they are ready and, and convicted around um, really an entitlement to what they feel they gave away, you know, this, this sort of, like you said, being like duped. So I think that, um, I think we're, we're part of, you know, sort of like a grand shift that is happening under our feet. And, and that's because the information's out there. It's all out there. And if you want it, you can find it and you can remind yourself what you already sort of know to be true, which is that, there ain't no magic pill. Hmm. And, you know, sorry. business, sorry. yeah, sorry, business is business. And if you forgot that the pharmaceutical industry is just a very, very 
lucrative, successful, and well-run business, and you thought that they're actually here to take care of you, along with your mommy and daddy, the FDA, you know, the CDC and the EPA, if you forgot, you know, that this is all just a business model, then you'll be reminded that it is because it actually takes the piss out of it when you mm -hmm. remember that. You know, there's no real injury or fear if you just can look at it more dispassionately and say, well, they're just doing pharmaceutical industry. I'm not warring against them. I mean, I've been positioned that way in, in many um, arenas. But the truth is, I'm not I'm not here anti-pharma. You know, they are doing what they told us they're doing, which is running a business, taking care of their shareholders, mm -hmm. right? They're not, they never said that they were here to take care of you. They're offering a product. Um, and so when we realize that, then we say, oh, all right, well, I'm just going to look over here instead for something that works better and feels better. <laughs> you know? I don't want to buy that anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so that's sort of where we are. And the hardest one is to acknowledge the interrelationships uh, between our governing bodies and these corporations. That's a really tough one because it can feel like slicing the umbilical cord um, in, in a terrifying way because, you know, well, if, if the FDA is not looking out for me and they allow, you know, all of this dangerous stuff like total, um, you know, basically vanishing documents uh, that, that even through citizen attempted recall are suppressed, you know, that show that these medications induce homicide, let's say, in a 10-year-old on a stimulant who suffocates her three-year-old brother, you know, if they vanish these documents, then they're not what I thought they were. And then who is taking care of us? Mm -hmm. You know, it's like this existential moment we pass through when we recognize that uh, we're not being taken care of in the way that we thought we were. And it's hard, and it's meant to be challenging, but it opens up so much room for awareness in so many other arenas, and it actually gives you back the power. It actually puts it back in your own agency, and there's nothing for dispelling fear uh, like feeling, you know, in control uh, in a way that you thought you had to depend on your doctor and your pharmacist and your, you know. I have patients who literally worry about you know, the grid going down because they don't know what would happen if they couldn't get their psychiatric medication for 24 hours. I mean, that's, that's a pretty disempowering way to live, right? Yes. So there's a lot of messages embedded in the way we engage our healthcare today that are just holding us captive. And it's exciting to, to, to recognize there's an opportunity to approach it differently. Well, we're in the middle of it, right? So these are exciting times. And there's a lot happening yeah. as we speak. And, and I think there's some sort of disintermediation, too. It's a different subject for a different call. But uh, <clears throat> when you have a third-party insurance company that's like, oh, we got this. So it's like, oh, I'm not actually paying for this Prozac. My insurance right. is paying for it. You're not, you, you, you know, the, the purity of a transaction is, is kind of uh, displaced. And so you don't even think about the fact that you're spending $1,200 a month, whether you know it or, or society is, on some pill that you may or may not need. And so it goes, and there's a rabbit hole, but I think the moral of the story is clean up your house, clean up your diet, get, get yourself healthy and do the things that we know, the simple stuff that we know has worked for t since time immemorial. And um, I think, uh, you know, listen, I, I really, I, I commend you on taking a bold stance. You're, you're, incre you're incredibly courageous and you've, you've, st you've stood out in front of this for a long time. And um, I think that your book is, is really uh, making a, a splash, more like a tsunami for, for good reason, because people are sick of this crap. <laughs> it's true, yeah, no, it's true. I think that my only, is that, you know, mental illness not be cordoned off in this, you know, special black box that nobody touches, right? Mm -hmm. Because we all, you know, you and I know uh, that you can put, you know, Crohn's disease into remission. You have, you know, Terry Walls out of a wheelchair, you know, from MS, you know, based on dietary intervention. We have seen, you know, various, very serious maladies uh, put into total remission through lifestyle change. But for whatever reason, no one has wanted to touch mental illness, including, you know, the more severe mental illnesses like suicidal depression, uh, psychotic mania, and, and schizophrenia. And my, you know, plea is just, you know, just bring those into this 
uh, framework because they belong there. They belong there as evidence of evolutionary mismatch and bodily imbalance that is completely reversible. Love it. Love it. Dr. Kelly Brogan, um, her book, A Mind of Your Own, fantastic read. I love it. I love the work that you're doing. Uh, keep it up. And um, how do people find you? What's your website? First of all, thank you. It's such a pleasure to speak to such a like mind and inspiration. You know, you've been at this for a lot longer than I have in many ways and um, paving the way for, for this type of information. So I am grateful. Um, I am on kellybroganmd.com. I have a course coming out as a companion um, to to the book in case it's already sort of provoked some questions but doesn't seem like a deep enough dive. Um, so we'll be talking about it there called Vital Mind Reset. And otherwise, you know, try to keep um, the basic science as synthesized as possible to sort of help create a safe space for these incubation of these kinds of ideas. So I'm over there. I love it. Dr. Kelly Brogan, uh, near and dear to my heart. Check out her book and um, really think about what you can do in your life to clean up your act and uh, maybe not be so tethered to pharmaceuticals. Um, I'll see you next week.